Hi friends, uh, today we will do yet another um, gate 2015 problem. Um, gate 2015, this was asked in gate 2015 um, from the portion which we have already covered. Okay, now the question goes like this Which of the following statements are true for damped vibration? Let's see the statements one after the other for a system having critical damping the value of damping ratio is unity and system doesn't undergo vibratory motion so they are telling for critical damping zeta equal to 1 value of damping ratio is 1 zeta is defined as c is by cc so a system is said to be in critical damping when the damping coefficient the value of viscous damping coefficient is equal to that of critical damping coefficient so that makes sense the first portion of the sentence makes sense and the second point is that in uh, in the initial few lectures if this will be the response if you have a critically damped system this will be the response for a system which can be represented like this a single degree of freedom system i'm giving an initial excitation okay i'm, I'm giving an initial excitation so if i leave this system after giving an initial excitation and let's say the damping value the damping value is having critical damping that means see the value of this particular value the value of this particular damping coefficient sorry damping coefficient is given by cc or 2 root k then the response will be something like something like this so it is not undergoing any vibratory vibratory motion sorry it is it is not undergoing any vibratory motor it is coming into rest within the least time okay so the first sentence completely makes sense then the second one logarithmic degree method is used to determine the amount of damping in a physical system as i already told uh, this described in detail logarithmic decrement is given by 2 pi zeta divided by root of 1 minus zeta square where zeta will be my c by cc so if i can compute my delta then zeta can be computed from zeta quite, uh, the amount of damping present in the system can be determined because cc is a constant which is given by 2 root km so here cc is given by uh, cc uh, is given by 2 root km which means it is a, it, it's a function of only system characteristic which you already know so if you ask me how delta can be actually computed i have already explained this uh, in the previous uh, lectures but even then let me just explain it um if you're see, seeing my videos for the first time let's say i have an undamped system uh, undamped system so that my response is again similar to the earlier example i have a single degree of freedom system like this and my i'm giving it an initial excitation and then leaving a uh, leaving so, and so the first condition is i'm giving it a fini uh, initial excitation and the second case is that c is less than cc so that me means it, the system is under damped then what happens uh, uh, if the system is under damped then we can expect i made a mistake here oh sorry then uh, it will be like this you will see an exponential decrease in the amplitude now what we will do is we will measure um, the amplitude at this instance and then after a few cycles we will measure the amplitude let's say after n cycles because it won't be feasible to measure um, the amplitude between two consecutive cycles because the time gap between them will be so small so we we'll, let's say um, i will um, erase this portion so let's say i have my x1 and x1 which is the amplitude at um, at let's say uh, 
initially x0 or x1 then after n cycles i have a amplitude xn now how we can compute delta delta will be given by 1 by n log log to the base e x1 or x0 by xn so this is how we compute delta so the whole methodology goes like this you have a system you have a system you know the system characteristic the only unknown is the amount of damping present in the system then you will give the system an initial excitation you measure x1 wait for n cycles to be over then you measure xn then you compute your logarithmic decrement once you have your logarithmic decrement you com come here and calculate the damping coefficient and finally uh, plug it here fi compute your um, then finally we compute what what is the amount of damping in present in system because once we know zeta c can be easily computed now um, let's talk about the let's talk about the third statement the third statement says in case of damping due to dry friction between moving surfaces resisting force of constant magnitude acts opposite to the relative motion so the statement conveys two things the first thing is that the resisting force is of constant magnitude and the second thing is that it always acts opposite to relative motion now let's look at the let's look at what is really happening in the case of coulomb damping in coulomb damping always it is similar to dry friction we uh, from our high school physics know that friction will always resist motion and the magnitude of the frictional force will be always mu times n where mu is the frictional coefficient between the two surfaces and n is the normal force so see compare this with your viscous damping in viscous damping the damping force is directly proportional to the relative velocity between the surfaces so this may change the relative velocity between these two things may change because the mass will be moving at, in a different velocity so this force will vary but in the case of coulomb damping that is not the case the force magnitude always remains the same and moreover it will always oppose the motion so it will always act in the opposite direction to the relative motion that means uh, the third statement is also correct now the final statement the final statement says for the case of viscous damping the drag force is directly proportional to the square of relative velocity now i have explained this already in viscous damping we will what we will see is we will see the damping force directly proportional to the first power first power of the relative velocity so let's say i have a damper and this point is um, y and this point is x the force felt due to the damping or the due to the damper will be given by coefficient of my viscous damping coefficient of viscous damping multiplying with the multiplied with the relative velocity so you don't have to take the square it is just a linear relationship so the fourth statement is wrong so the answer for this particular problem is option c i think this is a very beautiful question because it it tests um the student uh it tests or it checks whether the student is having a good grasp grasp over um all the concepts of undamped vibration and then the type of different types of damping present in, that could be present in a system thanks thanks for watching